Uh, welcome to another Compliance Corner. Uh, today, I am joined by my colleague at Prevail, uh, Greg LaRoche. I should say I'm Orly Burlov, and today I'm joined by Greg LaRoche. Our normally um, scheduled Noel Vestal is up to her eyeballs in uh, paperwork, and so actually she's uh, busy on a very important project. So Greg is filling in for Noel today, um, and we should all be very happy for that because Greg, uh, like Noel, is a font of knowledge. Greg, what do you do here at Prevail besides being a font of knowledge? Yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, and uh, apologies for those expecting Noel. Um, and she'll be back soon. And uh, yeah, so I, uh, I had a product management here at Prevail, which means uh, all things product, roadmap, features, prioritization, pricing, messaging, a lot of things that have to do with our product and how we uh, manage it in its life cycle uh, from beginning to end. And uh, also the compliance team also uh, is part of the product team at Prevail because compliance is such an important part of what we do. So they, right. uh, they are part of my team as well. And you worked uh, in the government contracting world for a while before, or in your earlier days. So you have that familiarity as well. Yeah, I have um, put many products through the through the paces of compliance, as it were, both uh, FedRAMP and, and other standards. So yeah, I have a familiarity with what vendors need to do to right. make sure their products are compliant, ready to go. Yep. Um, and so. We have actually an interesting topic today, and I'm glad you can join me because uh, this is something you and I have talked about ever since you've uh, started on on the compliance team, and that is DFARS. And you very patiently explained this to me a whole lot. So today, we, uh, the topic is going to be about understanding DFARS C through G. Okay, so that's kind of like the bumper sticker headline for today's topic. But let's just take it back a step and say, if you are handling, uh, if you have a DFARS 7012 clause in your contract, and you can figure that out by going to sam.gov, looking at your contract, downloading your contract and seeing if, you know, doing control F DFARS 7012. So if you have a DFARS 7012 contract as clause in your contract, it means three things. One, you are required to meet NIST 800-171 to protect CUI. Two, you have to store all of that CUI uh, on FedRAMP in a FedRAMP um, moderate or, or equivalent uh, environment. And three, you have to meet DFARS C through G. And so that third point is what we're going to double down on today, that third requirement if you have a DFARS clause. So why don't we just take it a step back, a step back even further and start off with saying, okay, what does DFARS 7012 say? And then we can uh, jump on to C through G and let people kind of follow our train of thought here. Great. Yeah, sure. So I, I start with the name, right? So oh, the title of the clause, it's, you know, the the DFARS 252.204-7012. Right? Oh, I love it when you say that. It's a clause that does all these things. and But its title is Safeguarding Covered Defense Information and Cyber Incident Reporting. So that really tells us everything we need to know about kind of what is it. It's it's a set of requirements that are pretty much stated in, in paragraphs um, C through G, <laughs> as you would expect, that talk about how do you um, how do you handle cyber incident reporting in particular what kinds of information, as a as a, someone who has to meet this requirement, what kind of information do you have to have in the event of a cyber incident? How do you report a cyber incident? What what kind of information do you have to hang on to, and how long do you have to hang on to it? And um, and what might the government ask you for, and what kind of access are you required to grant them during their investigation? Should they decide to do an investigation after you report the incident? So that all just kind of stipulates a whole bunch of things that um, have to be in place in the event that there, a cyber incident occurs um, you know, within, a con within performance of a contract that has this clause in it. All right, you wanna show off how smart you are? Tell us what, C, what the C through G uh, clauses are. Yeah, I can do that, all right. Now. I have them committed to memory, in fact. Um, every oh, you're word, so smart, every right? word, front word All right, go, go ahead, go <laughs> off. Yeah, so the first one is reporting, right? So this clause C says that if you have it, it kind of just defines a little bit what a cyber incident is and what systems it encompasses or could encompass and what you do. <laughs> if you have a cyber incident, you have to report it to DC3 through a website um, that you know they provide even inside the clause called uh, didnet.dod.mil. 
and so you have to report the incident there, and there's a way you can do that as uh, as a defense industrial base company or supplier. That's that's C. That's FERC, right? So you have to report it and how to report right. it. Right. D. Next one is a um, malicious software. So it has to do with if you if if the attack or your cyber incident is related to malicious software that has been um, you know run in your environment, you have to discover and isolate it, and you're supposed to submit that malicious software to DC3 um, as part of your report. So that's another requirement. And then uh, E moves into media preservation and protection, which is um, this one's um, the one that probably is the most difficult for cloud service providers to meet. And that yeah. says that you're- What does that mean, media preservation? Yeah. It means you're gonna hang on to um, the, the images of all the known affected information systems that are identified as you know part of the incident and you have to maintain all that monitoring data for 90 days okay. from, from the submission of your cyber incident. And that so really that's logs, the all the logs? Yeah, logs, snapshots, configurations, um, basically whatever the state of the systems were in, you have to be able to hang on to that for 90 days just in case the DOD wants the media or wants the information. Um, if they do request it, it's your obligation to have it. And so there are you know, commercial clouds and other vendors that, that won't agree to provide this kind of information um, to the tenants that are running in their cloud. So you need to make sure that you can cover that. Okay, so that was a C, D, E. That was we're the e. F. <laughs> now we're up to F. F is access to additional information, which is really if the DOD or the DC3 wants to actually access your equipment or network, um, to support a, a forensic analysis, for example, you have to let them do that upon request. Um, right, so they have to ha be able to access your facility. And what is the last one, Greg? G is, um, again, if, if there's a, uh, an investigation, part of that investigation will likely include a damage assessment, and this is specific to damage assessment. So basically, you're uh, obligated to provide all the information that you collected in the incident review or any damage assessment that you may have done and the media preservation activities conducted under um, the previous requirement and assist in the damage assessment activities upon request. So basically keep everything you know about the damage assessment and, and make sure that is available to support an investigation. Yeah, all right, so th that's a bit of a long-winded investigation, but bear with us, audience, because we're gonna explain to you why it's really important to kind of double down there. So we've explained all of these uh, things and we're saying, you know, these are the type of things you're gonna need to uh, be able to present to the DC3 committee in case there's any type of cyber incident. So what are we talking about with cyber incidents? We're talking about things like ransomware, we're talking phishing, uh, any type of successful phishing attack, uh, any type of spoofing. And, you know, you hear about those all the time in the news. If, as For example, the Colonial Pipeline attack um, back in 2021, you know, they shut down the Colonial Pipeline for um, probably at least a week, $5 million uh, were paid. You can talk about something like the Solar Winds attack, you know, where uh, Russian hackers were able to get into the Orion system and then push malware to all of uh, Solar Winds, to, uh, to you know, 10,000 companies that Solar Winds was used by, whether those were government agencies, other corporate office, uh, other corporations. And, you know, these guys, uh, these bad actors like large companies like Colonial Pipeline and Microsoft, but they also like going after the small guys because they tend to have lower, they are lower hanging fruit. And so while it's hard to find, you know, the exact statistics on what your chances are of getting um, hacked, just know that it's not a matter of if you're a hack, but a matter of when. And so with that in mind, that means, you know, defense companies, which have all sorts of very important information that bad actors would like to get a hand on, really need to be cognizant of this, um, of this challenge uh, or this threat to their data um, and, you know, take steps to ensure that they are protecting themselves. Um, so let, let's just kind of delve into that. You know, that we talked about uh, C through G, what the folks at, the, at uh, Defense Cyber will look for. Um, so if you have one of these incidents, you know, and again, as we said, it's not a matter of if, but when, and you're not able to, uh, for example, show 
snapshots, able to provide logs, able to explain what was the state of the system at the time of attack, uh, what happens? Yeah, uh, there's a a whole bunch of not good things. (laughs) So uh, I think, first of all, if you can't comply with the requirement that's in your contract, you're now violating the terms of the contract that you agreed to and that you signed. And so that's one bad thing is that now you're not fulfilling the terms of the contract and the, and the purchasing agency could use whatever, you know, liquidated damages or penalties clauses are even inside the contract um, for material breach. Um, but that probably isn't the end of it. Probably now, you know, now DC3 is aware that you have a, a you know, inferior um, cyber program that doesn't meet the DFAR 7012 requirement. And it's very likely they could either select you for additional audit and investigation um, or a tabletop uh, program review from DIBCAC or DCMA. Um, or even if they think there's malicious intent, they could forward you to the DOJ and look at um, look at false claims. Because uh, you're making a claim when you accept 7012 that you're going to meet this requirement. Right. And, and so that's a big deal, right? You know, we talk a lot about the need to meet compliance. Well, because you're required to, right? But there's also this part that uh, there are a lot of uh, bad actors out there who would really like to get their hands on your information. And more than just check the box, it's good security. It's good cybersecurity to be um, implementing these C through G requirements in the 7012. And so, you know, you really want to protect yourself from ransomware. It is a big crisis. and It's not going anywhere. And so you need to continue to maintain a kind of a, a vigilance there. Um, but the reality is, right, if you're a, a defense contractor, you're probably not responsible for ensuring those snapshots are being taken care of because you're not probably ma- managing your cloud platform, right? That's right. A lot of these systems have been outsourced to cloud providers or managed service uh, models. Yep. And so that's kind of the third point we want to make here, right? So if you're, you know, you have to meet C through G um, and let's say you're even buying our argument that it's not just a matter of compliance, but it's also a matter of protecting yourself from ransomware and doing good cybersecurity. And then a third, that there are all these really nasty things that can happen to your business if you don't comply. Um, there's this thing, you know, even if you are, if you are an honest broker and you're trying to figure out how uh, to determine whether someone, uh, your cloud providers, um, meeting C through G, what do you do? I mean, do you just like say, hey, Mr. Service Provider, do you meet C through G? You, you could start there. I think it's, there's a really important concept in your question, Orly, and that is the, the idea of flow down. So um, the 7012 requirement flows down. So you, you might have, if you're a supplier in the supply chain, you might have gotten that requirement flowed down to you from above, from a prime, let's say. Right. Um, and then now if you're using a cloud service provider to, um, you know, to store process or handle um, controlled information in any way, that's now flowing down to that provider, right? So that requ- now that requirement is their requirement. So you have to make sure they understand that, for one thing. So that's where you start. Right. And secondly is, um, you know, you do have to ask the right questions because there are cloud service providers out there um, providing a commercial, like say commercial grade cloud services or productivity suites. And they're not going to accept that clause because the data is not separated um, appropriately to provide the kind of forensic images. That so why don't you just double click on what that means, right? It says, it says that they're being malicious. Like, let's say you went to Microsoft commercial and you say, hey, Mr. Microsoft commercial, do you meet C through G? Um, great example, yeah. I mean, and it, no shade on Microsoft, but their commercial is such a large enterprise, right, that they have servers all over the place and to be able to meet C through G is a significant burden um, that kind of a commer- their commercial operation can't necessarily meet. And so, for example, for Microsoft, you have something that's called GCC Hive, right? If you have Microsoft commercial, you're not able to meet um, the requirements for DFAR 7012. And so you have to go to this higher level security. Right, a separate um, cloud. A separate, a separate cloud, cloud. right. Yep. I mean, so if someone were to ask prevail, how to prevail, how do you show that you meet C through G? What would we yeah. do? What we do, well, we, we can provide, you know, documentation that explains how we do it for each paragraph. Um, and, and we can attest to that. That's, um, that's something we will agree to um, the terms. If, you know, if, we're, if we're working with a customer, we certainly agree to the responsibilities of C through G. 
uh, as part of doing business. But just in terms of how we do it, it, it has to do with how we manage our cloud operations and the cloud vendor we work with. And right. So, you know, we built we have built a dedicated cloud for this right. solution, and we can access and control all this information for ourselves in in the hosted environment. So we're not relying on, say, yet another third party to provide um, this kind of information. We we keep it ourselves. And so right. we may be using a you know we use the AWS infrastructure behind Prevail. That's but, Amazon Web Services for you boys and girls. Yes, uh, and, and Web Cloud in particular, which is their compliant cloud uh, right. that, meets, that meets the higher FedRAMP standards. And, um, and you know, we were, you know, as part of building our product on that platform and running it there, um, we make sh we've made sure that we have all these bases covered. Yeah. And so I, I bring up our an example of Prevail just because it's one that I'm familiar with, um, not necessarily to brag as much as to say, you know, this is the type of questions you should be asking of any cloud service that you use to handle CUI, right? Make sure they can get, ha they have a conversation ready saying, yes, we store it on Amazon Web Services on their government high uh, platform, or we store it on a, a another platform, or we store it uh, on-prem, um, but they should be able to explain how they're able to meet the, those C through G requirements. And, uh, you know, if they're not, that, that should be, um, Kind of a red flag that well you know maybe these guys aren't the solution for me um yeah yep and and like, like we said you if you're using a kind of a commercial off of the shelf common platform that that is used you know everywhere in all kinds of businesses regulated and non-regulated then it's, it's it's something you should definitely look into because there's a there's a chance that your um commercial cloud solution will not accept that flow down. Just because, right. as you said earlier, Orly, it's very difficult for um, you know, commercial clouds with all thousands and thousands of tenants all mingled together all over, the, all over the geographies that they support, they really aren't in a position to provide that data. So, um, so you need to you know, look at those systems in particular because they're, they're likely to be the ones that cannot accept that requirement. All right. Well, I hope everyone who's listening to this video enjoyed the education. Um, and now you know a little bit more about D4C through G, why it's important, what it means, and uh, what you need to do to make sure that you are compliant with it. Um, and we hope you'll turn in, tune in next time for our next edition of Compliance Corner. Thanks again to my colleague, Greg, for uh, substituting, and you've been great fun. So I hope you'll join us again. Happy to be here. All right. Bye-bye.